Welcome to Culture Beat. I am Rastambora Kitwana. And I'm Marlene Phillips Lee. For centuries, the economy of St. Kitts has been dependent upon the processing and harvesting of sugarcane. Generations of families have had extensive and rewarding careers within the sugar industry. Some have contributed up to 40 years in service. In one form or another, the sugar industry has touched the lives of many people living in St. Kitts, Nevis and Anguilla. If you didn't have a father, a mother, a brother or a sister already working in the sugar industry, you knew of an uncle, a cousin or a great grandparent who had. In the early 1600s and throughout the duration of the sugar industry, cane was harvested by the hands of slaves. People living quiet lives were violently captured in their native African lands, transported by sea in unbearable conditions, then distributed around the Caribbean and forced into hard labor on various sugar plantations. These acts were gravely unjust, but widely accepted by its European enforcers. The sugar industry grew quickly as the market increased. Soon cane harvested by individual estates whose mills were driven by wind, steam, and sometimes animal power could no longer keep up with the demand. In 1912, when Henkel Duberson and Company Limited had the St. Kitts Bastia Sugar Factory Limited built, sugar production became centralized and more efficient due to modern equipment and facilities. This factory was built in 1911 and commissioned in 1912. During its first year of operation, it produced a total of just about 3,700 tons of um, sugar. Subsequently, uh, this has, uh, did improve over the years, and it got to a record level in 1953, where the factory produced around 51,500 tons of sugar. Uh, there were other years where they produced um, around 50,000, at least two or three other years where they produced 50,000 tons of sugar. But those were the, the high points. At present, we are averaging about 22,000 tons of um, sugar on a yearly um, basis. The sugar factory offered a great stable opportunity for many people on St. Kitts. I learned a lot of things, and I'm able to do a lot of things, and I work almost every day on the sugar factory. They encouraged me, you know. At times when you feel like giving up, and they said, no, you just continue, and I moved on. I remember when I got into the, went into the buildings, a gentleman said to me, you should not be in here. Someone said to him, he said, don't worry that, you know. I need to learn everything, one and everything. You want to get these soft and hard, that when I get into it, I go anywhere, I haven't any problem. A lot of the folks on the sugar factory, when they see me doing different things, and you know, they said they did not like it, they said, well, you have to learn to do everything. That's the idea, you can't be doing one thing. Because if you have to, this job is closed, you have to go and do something else. The sugar factory provided employees with a medical center, grocery, bakery, laundrette, and a social center. I know in the old days, probably back in the 1940s and 50s, there was a fund called the Sugar Industry Labor Welfare Fund, which was set up as a result of an inquiry into the sugar industry by Lord Solbury. And funds were provided for putting up small parks and playing fields in different parts of the island, but also for the establishment on the sugar factory compound of what is now called the Sugar Factory Social Center. I must tell you that that was put up to counterbalance um, similar facilities which had been provided for the senior staff on Connery. They had a beach house and um, swimming arrangements and that kind of thing. And the Sugar Factory compound, the Labor Welfare Fund, uh, provided the funds for setting up the Sugar Factory Social Center. So there'd be lawn tennis, um, places for playing things like drafts. There was a bar, there was a concert hall, 
and that kind of thing. Over the next couple of years, the Sugar Manufacturing Corporation would experience some ups and downs, but still survive to see its 50th anniversary in 1962. Well, the factory is a very old factory. And as a result, you have very old equipment. Very often when we're looking for parts, you have a problem getting parts because the equipment is so old, it's almost outdated. So we have to go back to suppliers who are going to actually produce parts specially for us. As a result, it can be very expensive. We also have to do as much homemade stuff as we can here. Taking into consideration the age of the equipment, and most of them, you do not get parts of them. And if we have to send back to the manufacturer to get these parts, it would cost us a lot because they would have to go and get molds and you know, go back to old drawings and to, to get these things. So for, from my standpoint, it do cost us less in order to manufacture these spares and pieces in order to get the machines running. The equipment is old and it's I don't want to say dilapidated, it belongs to another century or another era. I was appointed chief executive officer of the field side of the sugar industry in 19, around about 1970-71, when an organization called the Sugar Industry Rescue Operation was set up to try to secure for the country the services of the sugar industry. Sugar industry by then had fallen on very perilous times and they had, fall, they had fallen from crops of about 52,000 tons to crops of in the low 20s, about 20, 21,000 tons. And in 1972, at the instance of the owners of the sugar plantations, the government was asked to take over the field side of the industry and to manage it to try to revive the flagging fortunes of the industry. The sugar industry rescue operation worked from 1972 to 1975 and was succeeded by the National Agricultural Corporation. Trade unions were officially established in St. Kitts by an act of 1940. And arising out of that the St. Kitts Nevis Trades and Labor Union was established. For persons who have lived in the country, and even pe people from abroad, they must know that the St. Kitts Nevis Trades and Labor Union was monolithic. It provided for domestic workers, some civil servants, some bank employees, even some teachers who are members of that organization, and the rank and file of workers in the sugar industry, field and factory. As a result, the St. Kitts Nevis Trades and Labor Unions, on, on an annual basis, provided a number of resolutions and recommendations which had to be negotiated with the Sugar Producers Association, which was the official trade union representing field and factory owners. And they had to reconcile these um, recommendations before the start of crop. They held several meetings, and if they weren't satisfactorily concluded, then the matters was turn, were turned over to the Department of Labor for conciliation. Sometimes matters were deferred. But on an annual basis, the St. Kitts Nevis Trades and Labor Union secured improved conditions of work for its workers. Today, we're going to meet some of the devoted employees of the St. Kitts Bastyr Sugar Factory Limited. My name is Clarence Machos, machine shop foreman. My responsibilities are um, to assist the superintendent with the daily planning of the jobs in the workshop, to assign tasks to workers, taking into account the individual skills, the attitude and the demand of the workshop. I'm also in, you know, in charge of the shop in, to ensure that um, jobs have been done well, accurately and also on time also have the responsibility of ensuring our workers follow safety rules and comply with all rules and regulation of the workshop and factory. 
So in most cases, we use the old ones to make back that part. Sometimes we do redesign, you know, to suit the needs. This factory was built in 1911 and commissioned in 1912. During its first year of operation, it produced a total of just about 3,700 tons of um, sugar. Subsequently, uh, this has, uh, did improve over the years and it got to a record level in 1953 where the factory produced around 51,500 tons of sugar. Uh, there were other years where they produced um, around 50,000, at least two or three other years where they produced 50,000 tons of sugar. But those were the, the high point. At present, we are averaging about 22,000 tons of um, sugar. Another very important aspect of sugar processing is the transportation of sugar cane from its various locations around the island by way of locomotive, which is instrumental to the entire process. I was commissioned to do a report on the artifacts of the sugar industry on St. Kitts. Uh, already a report had been done on the buildings, uh, significant buildings in St. Kitts, some which were connected with the sugar industry and some that weren't. The purpose of doing the inventory was to go around uh, the sugar factory and then all of the, the uh, site yards that are being used by SSMC and some of the other sites that are now abandoned and first of all locate and then identify and record any machinery any of the artifacts from the sugar industry. We're out in uh, Nicola Township uh, mansion uh, sugar estate is just at the back of us in the yard and the bridge that we're standing in front of here uh, out in Nicola Township is one of a number of quite spectacular railway bridges that are on the island and because the, the bridge was used to carry the railway from out in the country round to uh, the sugar factory, the central sugar factory. Presently I serve as the transport services manager with uh, responsibility for the whole um, transport system uh, from the tractors that go to the field to collect the crane to the cranes, to the locomotives, uh, land rovers, anything that moves. We are responsible for the service and repair of those bits of equipment. Well, from what I learned, it's, uh, it was number, um, locker number 10, and it was responsible for bringing uh, the bits of equipment from the factory pier to the site here at, uh, at Golden Rock. That was in um, 1911 when the factory was being built. The first bit of track was laid from what we know now as the um, factory pier up to the Golden Rock site where the factory was built. There are certain superstitions. In the old locker number 13 was changed for the same reason a number of um, unusual accidents, and it was given the name of Churchill. I'm Vincent Joseph. I'm the railway superintendent, SSMC. Uh, my responsibilities here are to maintenance of uh, 35 miles of uh, rail track, rail lines around the island, and we do the maintenance to 23 bridges. Bridges span from 7 feet long to uh, 300 feet. At the railway, we, at high peak season, we operate with 280 persons. Uh, that include local drivers, some uh, siding clerks. We have uh, switchmen, crane drivers, slingermen, gatekeepers. We also have some workers at the web bridge. They don't do the weighing of the cane. And so in crop is around 280. And out of crop, during the off season, we employ somewhere like uh, 105 persons to do the maintenance in preparation for 
for the following crop. And these, these people, the 105 persons, they work year round, and, 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 and the balance, 175 or so, we are just seasonal. And they, they contribute to doing most of the operations at the railway. Our job really is to bring the cane from all the way down at Belmont, from Belmont to the factory yard on time to keep the, the mill running for 24 hours. Over the years, the St. Fitzbastia Sugar Factory has experienced some major fluctuations within the sugar industry. These fluctuations have caused the St. Fitzbastia government to take a serious look at whether it's economical or not to keep the sugar factory in operation. We asked some very knowledgeable people in the sugar industry if the St. Fitzbastia Sugar Factory were to close, what could we do to preserve its memory? There's a fair amount of controversy surrounding that in that. Some people are of the view that it's no sense keeping lots of artifacts around if they're not going to be generating any income. You have a situation where you can have lots of various things around the country, and I've seen a, a report identifying copper pots, identifying plows, all of those kind of things were in different places. I know that the upkeep of a museum is very expensive. I think the sugar factory, which has been on site since the early part of the 20th century, perhaps around about 1910, 1911, and which to a great extent has fashioned lives and work for people of St. Kitts, Nevis, and some people from areas beyond, like Guyana and Barbados and Trinidad, should remain for posterity. They should be preserved, refurbished, and be allowed to be enjoyed by succeeding generations. I'll have to take you back to my youthful days. The sugar factory, in fact the sugar industry, but most of the sugar factory, has been woven into our way of life. In fact, in those days, things were not too well with us. So many of us didn't have clocks. So the sugar factory was our timepiece. I'll tell you what I mean. Um, as children, we were permitted to play at night up until 9 o'clock. We had to be in the house by 9. So how do we know when we get there? <laughs> we had to listen to the factory horn during the crop time. At 9 o'clock, we stopped play. We went by the water pipe, cleaned up, and we headed for home. Um, during the day time, we had to be back at school for 1 o'clock. Again, we had to depend on the factory. Many of us had to keep animals and had early morning chores to do. That means we had to get up very early in the morning. So we had to study the system of the horn blowing because we got up at the blowing of the horn very early in the morning, 5 o'clock or perhaps 6 o'clock, and got to go to our business. So it was part of our life. And it still is to a great extent because although we have our fancy watches and clocks and so on, it is the blowing of the horn that gives us the alert as to where we are regarding our timing, whether late or what have you. Um, another thing that impressed me as a young person growing up was the discipline of factory workers. Everybody looked up to people who worked at the sugar factory. In fact, the, the term was the, a factory man, and he was held with high regard and deep respect because there was no question of lateness. You could almost set your watch by the chaps going to work. And in fact, they got there well ahead of time and waited until the horn blew to admit them to work. So there was that question of discipline, which was very impressive. Um, some way should be found to retain the system of horn blowing. I don't know how it will be done. But it will be good to know that you can still get up to hear the factory horn. It's just part of you. Without that, it doesn't seem to be the life that we know it. Sugar has dominated our lives for, for many generations, you know, and it is important that we preserve that history. Well, the simple answer is yes, but while it's good to say we should keep all our artifacts and we should preserve our heritage, that has to be balanced against the cost. I know in lots of countries, you need, and very small towns in the UK in particular, you have lots of benefactors who actually contribute money towards that purpose. 
if you can upkeep them, if you can afford to do it and keep them in a, in a state where the, the public can appreciate them, then fine. I know it's going to help to give some support to the tourist industry in that you've got to have something uniquely petitioned for tourists, tourists to come and see, uniquely current and uniquely historical. But I think that has to be balanced against the cost of, of, of upkeep. Now we'll also have to tell the history about the people itself. I think, uh, I think that is one of the very important aspects. The economy, these artifacts can tell the story people in the past and how we have evolved to where we are presently. The St. Kitts Bastyr Sugar Factory has brought forth the modernization of industrial machinery. It has been instrumental in the evolution of the trades and labor union and it has also marked the beginning of an important era of cane production on the island of St. Kitts. We hope that you will take stock and join in with the many voices that you've heard making a public appeal for the preservation of one of the most fundamental parts of Haitian history, the St. Kitts Bastyr Sugar Factory. We hope that you have enjoyed our brief look at the sugar industry on St. Kitts and we look forward to meeting you on the beat. Culture Beat, a soy go.